Hi everybody, this is Lara Spencer from Good Morning America. I heard Disney Parks fans are having a little get together today with one of the fabulous Disney chefs. I just wanted to pop in and say hi. I love Disney Parks and let's be real, we all love that food. Enjoy that Canadian cheddar cheese soup and that filet of beef, it sounds so good. Have a great day, I'll see you guys soon on Good Morning America, enjoy. Thanks for popping in, Lara. Boy, it smells delicious in here already, and we haven't even begun cooking. Hi, everyone. I'm Jackie Sosa. Welcome to Disney Magic Moments in the Kitchen. Disney Magic Moments is a program we launched actually back in April. It was Disney Parks' way to deliver Disney magic to fans and friends around the world in their living rooms or wherever they want, really. Today, we have shared more than 340 stories, videos, photos, and experiences, including cast members delivering thousands of pounds of supplies to food banks around the world. We've introduced new members of the Disney family at Disney's Animal Kingdom. We've spotlighted creative ways families have shared their love of Disney together. We've gone around the world to share sunrises above our castles. And we've dished up popular recipes from Disney parks and cruise ships. Today, we are excited to welcome you to Disney Magic Moments in the Kitchen. Our very own Disney chef is going to showcase two of Disney's most popular dishes. First, though, some fun facts. Did you know there are more than 700 food and beverage locations at Walt Disney World and Disneyland Resorts? There are more than 1,000 if you add in our international parks. There are almost 400 chefs who create the delicious dishes at our domestic parks, and many Disney restaurants, chefs, and sommeliers have received multiple accolades and awards. Napa Rose at Disney's Grand Californian Hotel and Spa has received four diamonds from AAA every year since 2012. Victoria and Alberts at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa in Florida has been a AAA five diamond recipient every year since 2000 and for the third year has received the Forbes Travel Five Star Award. It is an amazing restaurant. If you haven't eaten there, you don't know what you're missing. You got to check it out. Only 32 other restaurants in the United States hold both of those awards. And we have one of them right here in Central Florida. From fine dining to your favorite snacks, we've got you covered at Disney Parks. We're coming to you from one of the many kitchens at Epcot at Walt Disney World, where Taste of Epcot International Food and Wine Festival is in full swing. You can sample amazing food and wine from six continents. And trust me, you'll be going back for seconds or possibly even thirds. Okay, back to Disney magic moments in the kitchen. I'm here with Disney Festival chef Kevin Downing, and we're gonna make two of the most popular dishes at the festival. Can you guess which ones? All right, time's up, I'm gonna tell you. Canadian cheddar cheese soup and filet of beef with roasted mushrooms and truffle burr blanc. Delicious, I'm starving already. Both of these scrumptious dishes can be found at the Canada Pavilion as part of the Food and Wine Festival. Now. As you can see, we are both wearing face coverings and we will be standing six feet apart for safety. And before we get started, an important reminder, we'd like to always remind our guests to please supervise any children who may be helping you from home. Now it's time to cook. Let's get started. What do you say? <laughs> Hi, Chef Kevin. I got to tell you, I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> I'm dying to taste these things today. Well, hi, Jackie. Welcome to Epcot. Thank you very much. And I'm loving this setup that you have here as we prepare to cook that soup. Well, thank you. Yeah, we uh, work really hard to make sure we have all of our ingredients prepped and ready to go. Uh, we call that mise en place, uh, which in French really means everything in its place. So we, when we're building any recipe, we really work to get all of our ingredients set and ready so that we can work through the stages of the recipe uh, 
quickly and efficiently. So this is something that you do at home, I'm assuming, right? I, I try to do it at home. I'm not quite as good at it at home as I am here. OK, well, I think it makes it easier, like you're saying, to cook. So what do we have to do first? So we're going to do today is our uh, Canadian cheddar cheese soup. Uh, this is from uh, Le Cellier Steakhouse at the Canada Pavilion here at Epcot. We also serve this soup at our Canada Marketplace uh, during the Food and Wine Festival. So it's available in two locations during this time of year. It's a fan favorite, our guests love it. They come back for it year after year. Uh, so definitely happy to be able to share this recipe with you guys today. All right, let's do it. What All do we right. need to do first? So I have one pan going, it got a, getting it just a little bit hot. We're gonna start with the bacon. So really with this soup, kind of patience is a virtue. We really want to let those flavors develop. So there's a couple things we'll talk about as we go through the recipe, but we're going to start with the bacon. So we have our bacon right here. We're going to throw this into the pan. Is this like hickory smoked bacon this or just... This is applewood smoked bacon, okay. but any nice bacon will work for you in this. And it's a thick cut. This is a thick cut, okay. yep. And if you don't have thick cut, you can use uh, regular bacon as well. Uh, we are going to do a little blending of the soup a little bit later on. So it doesn't really matter if you have these big chunks in there right now because they will break down a little bit later on in the process. Okay, so what if uh, we're vegetarian? So Did if we you're vegetarian, that? we can certainly leave the bacon component out. We're using a chicken stock, but you could certainly use a vegetable stock as well, or a vegetable broth, or something along those lines if you wanted to uh, make it vegetarian. Okay, so you can remove that and it's not going yep. to You're still going to get the, the nice cheesiness of, of the soup and that creamy oh, texture, yeah. so it'll still have that uh, same kind of taste and flavor. You just aren't going to maybe get necessarily the smoke that you might get with the bacon that's in there. Okay, okay. that's understood. Okay, so we're cooking that bacon up so now. So we're cooking the bacon up, and really what we're looking to do at this point is kind of let the fat render, and you can see a little bit some of the bits of the bacon are starting to stick to the bottom of the pan. And is that's, that a good thing? That's really great because some of those bits, is that's where you get a lot of the flavor from. So uh, the more we kind of do that, the better. But our goal is to kind of let the fat render out just a little bit. And Are you cooking this on color. high heat? This is on a medium heat right now, okay. medium to medium high. So we really want to get that color developing and some of that crispiness of the bacon going before we start adding the rest of our ingredients. Okay, so how long do you think on the cooking time for the bacon? Um, it's really kind of by eye. I, I don't like to say necessarily a time because you kind of have to look at it. If we had to go by time, maybe five minutes, uh, but you're really kind of looking a little bit for what it looks like in the actual pan when you're doing it. So when you really get to that point that you think, okay, this is where I like it, and everyone likes their bacon a little bit differently. Like some people like it super crispy, right. some people don't like it as crispy. Um, you kind of leave it how, how you like it. So um, in this case, we do want to get a little crispier than that. I'm going to turn up the heat just a little bit. It smells so good in here, guys. you can smell it. Yeah, it's, it fills the entire kitchen. Bacon just kind of does that. And it wakes you up Everyone no matter knows what. when bacon's being cooked, right? for sure. But you can really see the fat now starting to come out. And that's really kind of important because in part of the next steps, we're going to need to build our roux. And that fat's going to help us do that. But I think we're at a point now where we've got some crispy bits going down in there. And we're going to go ahead and add some of our other vegetables. So okay. I have some uh, diced red onion. What if we have yellow onion or sweet Vidalia? Yeah, it, any it onion will work. Any onion, any onion will work. And then I have some diced celery. OK. Okay, so you're really good, obviously, at your knife skills. <laughs> if we can't dice it that small and they're a little bit chunkier, is, is, is that all right? Yes, because again, we're going to kind of do a little bit of blending of the soup. So if you don't get it quite as small, um, we're going to blend it just a little bit. But these days as well, in your local grocery store, you can usually find like diced onions and diced celery that's diced a little bit smaller. So that's kind of a nice thing. If you don't want to go through that process at home, you can usually find it. Your grocery store's already done it for you. They so. make it easy for us. All right. So we're going to let these vegetables cook just enough so they start to become a little translucent, just a little bit of kind of see through them a little bit, just barely tender. Uh, we don't want to overcook them because we are going to cook them longer as we make the rest of the soup. But you can really smell now like the onions yes. and the celery and the bacon all kind of coming Too together. Too bad you guys aren't here because this smells so <laughs> good. <laughs> So do, when you're looking at for translucent, I mean, you want the celery to be translucent as well because I, I would think the onions would be a little bit easier, The onions easier, are going right? to be the thing you're really going to notice. But okay. even the celery, you'll start to see it just turn just a little bit. You don't want it to get too soft, like I said. You're kind of looking at, for it to be a little al dente, just like similar to pasta, just a little bit of bite still to it. Okay. Uh, we don't want it to turn to mush while we're, while we're cooking it. No, mush is no bueno. So I think we're at a point now where we can go ahead and we're going to do kind of 
what could be the, the kind of the critical part of the soup. So we're going to add our butter. Is and that this, salted or unsalted? This is unsalted. Okay. You can use salted. It just means at the end you may want to adjust your seasoning a little bit more if you use salted butter at this point in the recipe. Uh, but we're going to add our butter just to kind of increase a little bit of the fat that's in the in the soup because when we add our flour, that's how we're going to make our roux. So uh, usually a roux is going to be equal parts uh, butter to flour. In this case, we have the bacon fat and we have the butter as well. So that's going to be kind of our base when we add our flour to start building our roux. Okay. Now, the, does the quality of the butter matter? Because you can go to the grocery store and there's an inexpensive stick for a dollar. You can spend like five bucks for a stick so, of butter. Does it matter really? In this application, I don't think it matters particularly. Okay. Um, you know, the more expensive butters are great if you're using something for maybe like uh, in our next recipe, uh, the sauce in our next recipe, or if you're putting it on bread, just a uh, snack on it. Uh, but in this application, your normal stick butter from your local uh, grocery store or supermarket will work just fine. Okay, because the star of the show is the cheddar. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. So our butter is almost fully melted. We just want to get it kind of fully melted down. I'm going to kind of break it up just a little bit. And again, you're still cooking on the, you haven't turned up or down I there. haven't really turned the heat down at all. So we're still going at this point right now. We will turn it down in a little bit. But our butter is almost fully melted. So at this point, we're going to grab the flour. There we go. We're going to go ahead and add our flour. So the flour is going to be what actually ends up thickening our soup. Okay, and so this is white flour? This is just regular white all-purpose all flour. All-purpose flour? Yep. Okay. So we're going to start building our roux. So roux is essentially uh, our thickening agent. So all sorts of roux out there, um, different colors um, from really white to uh, dark, uh, almost black. Um, and they all have different components. The darker you go with the roux, uh, the more flavor it has, but the less thickening power it has. So in this case, we're going to be looking for kind of a blonde roux. So not quite white, but definitely not on the dark side. It's going to be a pretty neutral flavor, uh, but it will give us some really good thickening, which is what we really want with this soup. So okay. that's going to be about four minutes. Okay, we have a question, Chef, sure. from Yadira. She would like to know, can I use turkey bacon instead? Great question, Yadira. You absolutely can. So if you prefer the turkey bacon to regular bacon, there's no reason you can't substitute that out. Wow, okay. that's a good one. Thank you so much for asking that question. All right, so we got our roux, and you said, again, you want it more on the blonde side. Yep. So as you kind of cook through it, we're looking for two things. You'll start to smell it a little bit. Um, a blonde roux starts having almost a little nutty component to it, almost a hazelnut kind of smell to it. Um, and that's what we're really looking for, that little bit of smell. And also, we're going to see it kind of come together. Um, and we want to cook the starch out. So that's the other reason we're really kind of doing this portion of it is to kind of cook some of that starchy flavors out, but still develop that nutty flavor that we're looking for in the roux that will help balance out the soup a little bit. What if we ruin the roux? What if we make it too dark? If you make it too dark, the soup will it just won't thicken quite the same. The flavor profile will change just a little bit. So if you go a little too dark, that's okay, uh, but it may just change the flavor a little bit. Okay. Just uh, be careful that you don't burn it. Okay. Okay. So I think we're at the point now our roux is really nice. Um, and we're going to add kind of our other components. So at this point, we're going to add our chicken stock and our heavy cream, or our, our milk, I'm sorry. Okay. So we'll add our... A lot of people, Chef, are using bone broth, chicken bone broth mm -hmm. these days for the collagen. <laughs> Is that okay? Can we substitute that? It's absolutely okay. Yeah, okay. we can certainly use that as well. Um, a chicken broth. Uh, bone broth, chicken stock, uh, you can certainly use that. And again, if you wanted to make it vegetarian, you can use a vegetable uh, stock or a vegetable broth as well. Um, that would be totally fine. Even if you wanted to use a vegetable broth with the bacon in it, you could do that too. It's, it's, it's not going to change the flavor of it too much. Okay, okay? Chef, we have another question right. from Heather. Heather would like to know, can you make this keto friendly and use almond flour or another substitute? So you can use another uh, flour uh, for it. It may not thicken quite the same, so you just have to play with it a little, little bit. And it may require a little bit of adjustment on the recipe, so you may need to use a little bit more just because of the way uh, all-purpose flour has a, a certain way that it thickens, and some of these other flours don't thicken quite the same. So you just have to play with the balance of the flour to the, to the fat when you're making your, uh, 
making your soup. So anything's possible with anything's this recipe, possible. really. Yeah, and it really is about you experimenting at home. So if you're looking for a specific uh, a flour or a specific, you could use soy milk if you wanted to. Uh, you just have to experiment with it at home just to see uh, how it works, and then you can make those adjustments. Our recipe is the, the good base, but if you want to make adjustments to it, you can certainly go that route. All right, okay. it's your kitchen, your house, your rules, you do it, right? So at this point, we'd let this normally go a little bit longer, but for time's sake, we're going to go ahead and add our milk. Okay. All right. And that's regular whole milk, this is not whole 2%? Milk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we're going to give it a stir. All right. This recipe, you said, Chef, has been a staple ever yeah. since uh, Le Cellier opened. That's correct. 1982. 1982. 38 years this recipe has been on the menu, and th th that's just as insane how long it's yeah. lasted, and they haven't taken it off the menu. No, nope. uh, the guests, I think, would just... Uh, freak out if we took it off our menu at this point. So it's been on, like you said, since uh, uh, since Le Cellier opened in the Canada Pavilion, and it's been on ever since. And it so. doesn't matter what time of year, we're that, still exactly. going to come in and have it's that soup. It's the middle of summer, and our guests are still eating the soup. Uh, and it's been on our festival menus for quite some time uh, now as well. And this year is no yep. exception to that, so people will have plenty of bowls of this deliciousness. So at this point, we'd want to bring the soup up just a little bit, kind of to a, just a boil. The boil is going to help the starch release and kind of start thickening the soup. Okay. Uh, just be very careful. When you say at this just point. a boil, I have to ask. So, because I, for me, that means like a fast boil. We want to see it kind of just start to bubble, and then we're going to turn it down a little bit to let it simmer. And we want to let it simmer for 15 minutes longer. Uh, we don't want it at a hard boil because we do run the risk of the milk starting to scorch, and that would certainly ruin the soup. So, okay. we want to avoid that. So, we want to bring it to a boil just to kind of get it start the thickening process, but then we want to turn it down to let the flavor develop for about 15 minutes, and that way we don't have to worry about the soup scorching, but we do want to keep our eye on it and keep stirring it throughout the process. Okay, so I was going to ask you that. We don't just like yep. lower it and walk away. Yep. You have to stir it every now and then or it'll yep. burn on the bottom uh, yeah, or something? Yeah, just uh, always keep an eye on it just because with milk you have to be very careful that you don't end up scorching. Okay. Okay. So we've got this. We're going to move over to this uh, pot here, which really has the soup kind of all ready to the point that we're looking for. So you can kind of see it's a lot thicker. Uh, it's kind of reached that point that we want, uh, and we're ready to add some of our last components uh, before we would serve it at this point. Okay. All right. How about the cheese? So the cheese and the beer are going to be going in next. Okay. So those are the one of the last components that we're adding. Yep. So uh, I have the cheese. This is a white uh, Canadian cheddar. Any cheddar will do, preferably a sharp, uh, just because it gives that extra bit of bite to the okay. soup. Uh, but you can use a yellow, you can use the white. Uh, just know that the yellow may change the color of the soup just a little bit, but it'll still give it the same flavor profile. Okay, does it have to be one of the expensive cheeses? It or doesn't does have anything to be. Go? No, okay. I think any white cheddar or sharp cheddar will do just fine. Okay. Okay. And if we're lactose intolerant, can we use vegan you cheese? A, you could use a vegan cheese. Like I said, you could use a soy milk or something along those lines uh, for the soup as well. Okay. okay, and is it important to have it grated? It, it is important to have it grated because it will help melt into the soup a lot faster. Okay. Okay? So I have the... I have the cheese. This is our beer. We're using a Canadian lager. I have a little bit already heated up, so we're going to just put that aside, but I have a little bit heated up here behind me. But the first thing we're going to do is incorporate the cheese. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of put this in here. You're making this look so easy, Chef. I'm going to give it a little bit of a whisk to start incorporating the cheese in there. And then I'm going to grab our beer as well. And you've heated that up. I heated just, it up. Just to a, like. Just so it's at the same temperature as the soup already, so it doesn't cause any clumping or anything along those lines. Okay. We have another question okay. from a viewer. Ricky oh. would like to know what are some good beers to use for this recipe that you can get from your local grocery store? So, really, you can't go wrong with adding any beer that you personally like. So I like IPAs. It would be great in this. Um, it's just going to change the flavor a little bit. You get those hoppy notes with those IPAs, so it's going to give it a little bit of that characteristic. If you wanted to use a dark beer, like a, a, a Guinness or something along those lines, you could certainly add that in there as well. Uh, and that's just going to, again, it's going to give it a little more smoky flavor. Uh, but any beer that you like, 
could go in here. Because you're going to like the soup. You're going to like the beer. You're going to like the soup. It's a perfect soup. marriage. All right. So we've got this kind of where we where we want it. And now I'm just going to grab our immersion blender, and I'm just going to give it a little bit of a pulse. What if we don't have an immersion blender? So you can use, uh, continue to whisk it. It may just take a little bit longer time. You could transfer it into a blender if you had a blender. This is really just to help smooth it out just a little bit more. If you have the bigger chunks of bacon, it's going to break them down just a little bit. But there's nothing wrong if you want to keep those big chunks of bacon in there as yeah, well. Yeah, it makes right? it nice and hearty. So at this point, our soup is really almost ready. So we're just going to grab the last few components here. Okay. So we're going to add a little bit of Worcestershire. Worcestershire sauce in there. That's a surprise. We're going to add just a little bit of Tabasco for just a little heat. Can you use, so, so what's it called, sriracha? You Is could, it? yeah, okay. absolutely. And then I'm just going to kind of stir all this in here. Yum. Incorporate it in. And then I'm going to give it a quick taste just to adjust for seasoning. So you taste it before you add the salt and pepper. Yes, I like to taste it before I add just because uh, it, you don't want to add too much. You can always add more, but you can't take it out once you have it in there. Especially when it's salt. Yep. We have another question from Lou. How many servings do these ingredients provide at these measurements? Oh. Excuse me, I'm tangled. Wardrobe malfunction, there we go. Yeah, so uh, how, many, how many servings do these so ingredients provide? This is uh, 10 servings, uh, normal soup size portion, so probably about a cup, eight ounces, uh, but this is, recipe is for 10. For 10, okay. okay. I think the seasoning, the salt is spot on. I'm just gonna hit it with a little bit of pepper. Thanks for your question, Lou. A little pepper. Incorporate so that in as well. So it tastes delicious, I think Perfect. it's right there. Ooh wee. If I didn't know better, I'd say it came from the restaurant. <laughs> And these are 100% the ingredients. It's not like we're holding back any of the secret this sauce or exactly anything. This is exactly what how we would do it in in uh, Le Cellier Steakhouse or for out of our production kitchen for our Canada marketplace. Okay. So I think we're good to try. Are you ready to try? Are some? you kidding me? All I right. woke up waiting for this. That looks so good. Mmm. -hmm. Let me uh, give See? that just a little wipe for you. Thank you very much. And then I'm just going to garnish it with a little chopped uh, green onion. A little green onion on mm -hmm. that. And then <gasps> there you go. Thank Enjoy. you. I am so honored to be uh, tasting this soup prepared by Chef Kevin. So if you have to excuse me, I'm going to take off my mask, obviously, only to try the soup. And then I'll be placing it back on. And you know what, Chef? I really hate like eating on camera because I never <laughs> think it looks good, but I'm gonna have to try it. How'd I do? You nailed it. Perfect, <laughs> that's what I like to hear. Oh my gosh, if I were a shark, my eyes would be rolling behind my head. <laughs> this is so good. So this is a recipe for 10. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do if we only have four in our family? Can we, can we save this? We have to save this pot of gold. <laughs> so what I would do is chill mm. it down in your refrigerator, then portion it into smaller containers. You could put it in your freezer, uh, and then it'll hold indefinitely in your freezer. When you're ready, pull it back out. Let it thaw in your refrigerator before you heat it up, and then pop it into your microwave or pop it back on a pan. D delicious. All right. This is so delicious. Uh, thank you so very much. You're very welcome. We are getting ready for entree. Absolutely. And what are we cooking up next? Uh, it'll be our beef filet with roasted mushrooms and truffle beurre blanc. Okay. Chef uh, Kevin is going to get us prepared for that. In the meantime, I'm going to give you a taste of all the new merchandise that's available this year at the Food and Wine Festival. And also, some of these items are available. ShopDisney.com. A plethora of t-shirts to choose from, whether you like the, sh the regular shirts, the tank tops, or the long sleeve. There's a lot going on, of course. We are talking about the Food and Wine Festival. So some new stemware that came out this year. Cheers to 25 years for those of us who like to drink with our pinkies out. And then, of course, the stemless glassware, a new stainless steel 
tumbler that's insulated for your um, beverages to keep them nice and cold. And this I love. I love, love, love these little food trays. Of course, it makes it super easy to travel around the world and uh, have your snacks and enjoy your beverages. And I also use these at home with my kids because I think it's fun for them too to have their little snacks. And I just put obviously some juice or milk or something in here to make them feel special because after all, they are very special to me. This shirt here is to die for. Look at it. Taste your way. It's, it has reversible sequence on it. So if you like red wine, there you go. If you like white, voila, I would keep it like this because, hey, rosé all day. Let's just mix the two of them together. Here's a little tank top. Chef uh, uh, Mini, sorry, that's new this year. Chef Kevin, you've been outdone by the queen of cuisine, a new slogan this year. Of course, she's in the kitchen with her hubby. And we've got this little water bottle and this. Look at this adorable mug, chef-inspired hat with the Minnie Mouse on it. See, see the little chef hat? Little Minnie on the front, little bow on the back. Isn't that adorable? And last but not least, Figment. I mean, we all need a little imagination. And of course, Epcot is not the same without Figment. Look at this fantastic shirt. He's popping out a little pocket. And of course, a little Figment mug here. This is really nice. Both of these would go so well, will pair so well with your cheddar cheese soup. But this last shirt, I have to say, is my favorite. Long sleeve, it has a pocket, you're cute coming or going, look at the back. Look at the back of that. Isn't that adorable? It has figment on there, of course, the world and some cooking utensils. Ties in perfectly with the food and wine festival taste around the world. Again, you can purchase all of these things at Epcot and some of these items at shopdisney.com. Now, let's see if Chef Kevin is ready for round two. Are you ready for us? We are ready to go. All right, let's get started again. What are we doing now? So we are getting set up to do our beef filet with the roasted mushrooms and our truffle bourbon. blanc. So we're gonna start with our mushrooms. I have them right here. These are already prepped, so we're just gonna heat these back up. So what we've done with these is we've taken the mushrooms and we've uh, sliced them, roasted them in an oven, tossed them in a little olive oil, salt, pepper uh, at about a 350 degree oven for about 20 minutes to kind of cook them through. Uh, but at this point, you can then chill them down. You can hold them. We're just going to pop them back in a pan. What kind just, of mushrooms are those, These Jeff? are uh, baby portobellas. Okay. But you can use any kind of mushrooms that you really like. So any mushroom will really do. Anything, anything you have, anything you can purchase, just come yep, on up. Absolutely. And can you do that a day in advance? Sometimes you, I like to do things a day earlier. You absolutely. Know, if I can, you as could much do as possible. these kind of uh, the day before. Okay. Let them, let them just kind of sit there and then use them the next day. Not a problem. All right. So we're just going to let these start to heat up back here when we're going to kind of forget about them and we're going to focus our attention on the rest of the dish. Okay. okay? So we're going to start uh, with our truffle ver blanc. Ver blanc. So That's ber super fancy. <laughs> so sounds super fancy, not quite as intimidating as it sounds. In French, it means white butter, so this is really a white butter sauce. Uh, we're infusing it with some truffle oil to give it an extra layer of richness and earthiness, which will pair very well with the mushrooms and with our filet. And nothing compares to a truffle. Absolutely. There is no substitute for a truffle, right? I agree. I agree. Okay. So we're going to put a little oil in just to kind of get it going with our shallots. Is that extra virgin all This is extra virgin. Okay. And then we're gonna add some chopped shallots to this. Again, could we use any type of onion that we have? You could, could use you switch a, it any up kind for shallots. Of onion, yep. okay. And I'm gonna turn this down just a little bit because I don't want any color on the onions. If the onions start to get a little brown, it's gonna discolor the sauce. So again, we're going for kind of a nice white uh, creamy sauce. So we just wanna do enough where uh, we're just breaking them down, but we don't want really any color to go on them. Okay, explain that to me a little bit more. You said you're breaking them down, so we don't want them to be translucent. What we, are you we, looking for exactly? We do want them a little translucent, but we don't want them to start to get dark is really what we're shooting for. Okay. So because the dark, if we start getting color, we're going to start seeing that color in the actual sauce. And we don't want that. Exactly. This so at this point, I'm going to add the white wine. What kind of wine are you using here? So I'm using a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, the Sauvignon Blanc is a really nice wine. It uh, has some citrus to it and a, has a real crisp characteristic. So for this, it helps cut through the fat of the sauce, which is heavy cream and butter. So 
that little bit of crispness from the wine really helps cut through some of that uh, the fat that you're going to get when we make this sauce. Can we use any wine or? You can. It's just going to change it a little bit. I would just maybe avoid something super sweet. So a Riesling, maybe not. A Muscadet, not so much. Uh, but you could use a Chardonnay. You could use a Pinot Grigio. Uh, either of those are going to work fine. Uh, just stay away for something really, really sweet. I heard that when you're do when you're reducing the wine, that you can it's okay to use something that's inexpensive, budget friendly. Is that is that okay or? So for this my recipe? rule of thumb is it can be budget friendly, but it should still be a wine that you would drink um, out of a glass. So it can be a nice budget friendly wine, but it should still be something that you would be willing to pour in a glass and drink at home. Okay, that's my rule of thumb when it comes to using wine in in any recipe. I like it. We do have another question, okay. Chef, from uh, Julia. Julia okay. would like to know what can be used instead of mushrooms or truffles when you have a mushroom allergy. Great question. So for the filet itself, for the using the mushrooms, you could do any kind of vegetable, roasted vegetable, carrots, uh, a medley of carrots, parsnips, root vegetables, potatoes uh, would work well. You don't even have to put the truffle oil in. The beurre blanc itself would be super nice without even the truffle in there. So it's still going to go over and be super luxurious with the filet and any kind of root vegetables or vegetables that you want to use. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for that question, Julia. So right now we're just letting the uh, wine reduce. Uh, we want it to reduce till it's almost dry. Uh, and that just takes a couple minutes. Uh, so we really are trying to kind of concentrate the flavor of the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and incorporate a little bit of the flavor from the shallots. We're going to strain the sauce a little later, so we're going to get those pieces out, but it should still have a little bit of that shallot flavor in, in the sauce when we're done. Okay, Chef, you have to settle the debate for me at my house. Okay. I watch some cooking shows, and I always notice that they take the meat out, and they'll say, let your meat come to room temperature. Mm -hmm. My husband is, take it out of the package and flop it in the grill, and he says, it doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Does the meat need to come to room temperature before you cook it? It does matter. Uh, in the restaurant, we would certainly uh, pull our steaks out. We call it tempering. So we pull them out, we let them come to room temperature. It really just allows the steaks to cook a lot more even. Uh, so when we season them and we put them on a grill or whether we sear them in a pan, it just allows for the steak to cook evenly as opposed to if it's still super cold, it can, it's, it's not going to get uh, as well cooked in the middle just because it's still really cold. And it allows some of those juices to kind of flow back out to the exterior of the filet as well, which helps when we go to sear it either on the grill or in a pan. Okay, and how long do we need to keep it out for? Uh, what 30 is it minutes. About 30, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, 45 minutes uh, is fine. Uh, that's going to let it temper just enough, get it close enough to room temperature where you'll be ready to sear it. Oh, my okay. goodness. Thank you so much for You're giving me my I told you so to my husband <laughs> when I get home You're today. You're welcome. I'm glad I could do that. <laughs> so we're about where we want to be with our wine. Uh, uh, it could go just a little bit more, but it, it does, at this point, we're going to add the heavy cream, and we're still going to continue to, to reduce it down. So even if we add it at this point, the sauce is still going to reduce. We do want to get it to a certain point, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit when we get a little bit closer. But at this point, I'm going to go ahead and take our heavy cream, and I'm going to add it to our sauce. Okay. And I'm just going to give it a nice little stir and kind of let it all come together. And again, for those who are lactose intolerant, they can try it with one of the milks, you believe? You think so? Yes, that's the they work? could try it uh, yeah, again without, you just have to test it and kind of see how it works. Uh, you know, these are, those other dairy-free butters tend to react a little bit differently to cooking. So you just have to see how they react when you, when you actually make it. So we're gonna reduce this down. I'm gonna turn it down just a little bit to let it reduce. And while we're letting it reduce, we are going to move on to our fillets. So I'm going to get this pan going nice and hot. I'm going to turn our mushrooms down. All right. And then we're going to focus our attention now on our, oh, our beef. Can we substitute filet for another cut of meat? Absolutely. So we use the filet because it's the most tender cut. And with this truffle sauce and the mushrooms, it and accentuates the dish just because of its tenderness and its butteriness. You can certainly use any steak that you like. If you are a New York strip guy, which I am, I love a New York strip. I, would, I could do a New York strip with this. If you like ribeyes, and even if you wanted something other than beef, whether it be chicken or pork, it's really up to you. Um, the flavors of the dish are going to work well with whatever you choose to use. And that's kind of one of my things, um, really. A lot of personal preference when it comes to cooking. Just because we give you a recipe doesn't mean that you don't 
can't take some time and experiment with it or change some things around. This is just the way we do it here in the restaurant, but we, we encourage you to really play with them and, 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 and make them your own when you're at home. Okay, these okay. are some beautiful looking fillets. These are we, really nice fillets. How do these, we pick something like that? How do we know what to choose so when we're at the grocery store? I look store? for anything that's got a nice red color to it. Um, and when it starts getting a little dull or a little gray, we want to be careful. Uh, but when you're looking for it in your uh, grocery store, your supermarket, look for fillets or any steak that's really kind of nice and bright red. That's going to show that it's uh, fresh and it's going to be perfect for you to use at home. Okay. okay. So the first thing we're going to do is season them. What kind of salt are you using? So I'm using just plain kosher salt. Is there a difference in the salts between the Himalayan salts and the, you know, the iodized salts and the kosher salts and the sea salts? Does it matter? It, it really just matters because of the, the coarseness of the actual salt. So but this looks like it's fine. This is fine, but it's a little coarser than if you were using the iodized salt, which is really very almost powdery. Okay. And you're, you're, you're doing this up here. Yeah, like trying this. to get it uh, spread out evenly. Okay. <laughs> and I've got my pan really nice and hot. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna season it from high. Yep, and now I'm gonna add a little oil. How hot is that pan? So this pan is at a medium high to high heat. Okay. Because we really want to get a sear on here quickly. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead. You can see once I add the oil, that it starts to shimmer in the pan and it starts to smoke just a bit. Yeah, it's That's smoking. what we're looking for because we want to put those in, and you want to hear that sizzle right oh. away. Oh, that succulent sizzle over there. And that sauce, you're giving it a little juice. sauce, I'm going to clear this yeah. out of our way. It is, it is, makes it so much easier when you have it, what's it called, the mise en place? Mise en place, Because then yeah. you're just It makes removing everything, everything a lot easier. Yeah. Um, it just I makes it easier that. for us to get everything done. And when you're working in a restaurant or a professional kitchen, it's all about timing. So we have to move at a certain pace in order to ensure that we get everything done in time. So having everything prepped out and ready to go, make sure that we can get through all the stages of the cooking process efficiently. And, and also make sure that you didn't forget an ingredient. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our fillets going. I'm gonna let them sit here for just a little bit. I wanna get a really nice sear on the exterior of both of these fillets. Once we get the sear on the one side, we're going to flip them, and then we're going to let them cook just a little bit in the pan. How do you know when you get the sear on the one side? Because so, I'm a peeker. I'm like, I'm the kid who always up the so Christmas present. So I'm a firm believer in not peeking too much. Okay. Um, I kind of just try to see if it'll pull. It should release from the pan uh, by itself. So if you start pulling and it's not coming off the pan, then let it sit for a little bit longer. Let it hang When out. it's got a nice sear on it, it's going to release from the pan, and you should be able to pick it up easily with no real uh, pullback. Okay, we have another question okay. from a viewer, Timothy. Timothy would like to know, uh, he says, I usually get steak <laughs> medium rare. Can you describe the pros and cons of the different steak temperatures? Great question, Timothy. So everyone likes their steak a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really no pro or con to it. Uh, it's that, again, is all personal preference. I like my steaks medium. I don't like them quite as rare, but I do like to have a nice uh, warm pink center. Uh, so when I order a steak, I definitely go for the medium. Um, if you like it a little more well done, that's certainly, uh, you know, your, your preference. And we, we certainly aren't going to say no. We want you to enjoy your steak however you like it cooked. Okay. And how can we tell? Short of ruining it by sticking a thermometer in there, because <laughs> like, you're, you're, you're poking it. Can you tell just by the touch? So... So for me, uh, and I've done this for a while now, uh, I can kind of look at them and kind of visually tell them kind of where they are in the cooking process. Uh, you can do it by time, but everything cooks a little differently. Uh, a trick I learned in culinary school was, let me put these here for just a moment, uh, was kind of if you take your hand and you kind of take your fingers like this and you kind of touch there, that's going to give you the feel of what like a medium rare would be. Okay. And at each finger, it's going to give you a different sense. So when you get to your pinky, it's going to be really firm. Uh, oh, yeah. So that'll be your well done. So that's a little trick that I used early on in my career uh, to help me when I was working the grill for the first time. So now I've kind of gotten to a point where I'm a little more comfortable with it. Um, so I can kind of just tell when they've reached a point, uh, whether they're medium rare. And I still give them a little squeeze. That's usually how I figure it out. I you give them a little squeeze the or just a little pop on the top. and. If it springs back, 
it's going to be a nice medium. And the less it springs back, the more well done it's going to be. Okay, okay, thank you for that. We have another viewer question. Jilly would like to know, is it okay to use a non-stick pan or is the stainless steel pan better? A non-stick pan will work. Uh, you may not get quite the same sear on it, but a non-stick pan will work. Uh, we use a stainless because you can kind of see the, like how, how you get those bits down on the bottom of the pan. Sometimes the, the non-stick doesn't do that quite as well. So that's why we tend to use stainless or cast iron a lot in our kitchens. Uh, but a, a non-stick, if, if that's what you have, it's going to work. You may just need to leave it in there just a little bit longer, maybe a little bit more oil just to get it, uh, get a nice sear on it. Okay. okay. Thank so, you, Julie. I'm going to let these kind of just cook for a little bit. All right. I'm going to, I'll tell you what, I'm going to grab this and just put these back here for a second. All right. And we're going to turn our attention back to our sauce. All right. So at this point, the nice thing about this is you can get it to this stage. You can turn it off and let it sit. Um, this is what we're looking for when it comes to being reduced down. You can kind of see the bubbles don't are kind of thick now. They're not real loose. Yes. So that's kind of the stage we're looking for when we want to get to, when we get ready to add our butter. Okay. Um, so we're at a nice stage. All right. You can see it's still got some cream in there. So we're going to take this and then start adding our butter. And we want to add it just a little bit at a time. Is this just plain unsalted butter again? Yes. Okay. So at this point, I'm taking it off the heat. Why is it important to add it a little bit at a time? Uh, if you add it too much, it runs the risk of breaking the sauce. So we want to just add it a little bit at a time so we can make sure we whisk it all in there and not let it break. Okay, we have another viewer question. Gregory would like to know, can you make the beurre blanc ahead of time so it's ready when the steaks are ready and you don't have to make them at the same time? So you can, um, and what we would do in that case is pour it into a separate container and you'll kind of see me do that in just a moment and then just keep it somewhere kind of warm. It doesn't have to be super hot. You don't want it sitting on a burner because it will cause the sauce to break, but you do want it somewhere warm where the sauce won't, because it is butter. So if it starts to cool down, it's going to seize back up and that's what you want to try to avoid. So what is the earliest we can make the steak? If you were to advise somebody, make your steak maybe, I mean, I'm yeah. not, excuse me, your I sauce, make maybe sauce, 30 minutes before the steak? Yeah, I wouldn't make steak? the sauce more than 30 minutes before you okay. want to eat. That looks so All good. All right, so we have that. That's perfect. And now we're going to add our truffle oil. Yum. And we're going to whisk that in. Does and the quality of the truffle oil matter? Uh, uh, it will change the flavor. Some truffle oils are going to be a little more pungent than others. You can find truffle oils now in most grocery stores. So it's a lot easier to find them. Uh, but now we have this beautifully, you can see it's a beautiful white sauce. It, it is, um, yeah. I have a little lemon juice here. I'm just going to add just a touch of it. I'm not going to add all of it. Um, this is just is a little bit of acid to it, but it, I don't want it to cut too much through. I really want that truffle to shine. So if you put too much lemon in, it can start to get a little overpowering and you lose some of the truffle, but you still want a little hint of acid to cut through it. So with the recipe, no matter what the recipe calls for, just kind of put a little bit first and then yep. taste. Okay. Yep. So at this point, our sauce is ready. We've got our mushrooms behind us ready to go. Our fillets are, are almost ready. So while they continue to cook, I'm going to go ahead and grab uh, this mesh strainer. Okay. And I have another viewer question for All you, right. chef. Denise would like to know, should you use white or black truffle oil? And what is the difference? So it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, Really, uh, truffle oils for me taste the same. A, a lot of the time, it's just a difference in price. Uh, whites tend to be a little more pricey than our, our black truffles. Uh, so it's a difference in price, really. What are we uh, using in this recipe? This is white truffle. Uh, this is uh, black truffle oil, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. All right, so now we're straining the sauce. If we don't have this strainer. Uh, you can do a little bit of a, a wider strainer, or you can even leave the shallots in there. Um, if, you, if you don't mind that little bit of chunk in there, you can certainly do that as well. Oh my goodness, this looks like melted vanilla ice cream. <laughs> it looks <laughs> so good. All right. And now I'm just gonna take this, and I'm gonna fold some of our, uh, I'm gonna fold some of okay, our- Okay, we uh, have one more viewer sure. question. Uh, Michael K would like to know, and where it says, in our house, the question comes up frequently, is a fresh lemon better than using lemon juice from a bottle? 
I think anytime you can use fresh, it's going to be better than something out of a bottle or something you buy in that's going to be pasteurized. Generally speaking, most of those juices are going to be pasteurized. So I think if you can do it at home and you can do fresh squeezed, it's going to change the dynamic of it a little bit. You'll certainly notice a difference. So fresh is better. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm going to add a little bit of chives to this just to give it a hint of color. Could we and reuse the scallions from earlier if we didn't have the chives? We could. Absolutely, we could. Yep. So... Oh, we're getting down to the good part. So again, I'm going to give it just a quick little taste to adjust for seasoning. Is it chef approved? It is chef approved. I think it's just spot on. So at this point, I think we're ready to to plate. Okay, but now normally gonna, you let, do you let that rest before you serve it? Yeah, so we would let this rest and I would tell you uh, I've cooked these to probably about medium rare. So if you're cooking your steaks uh, rare or medium rare, you can probably do it in the pan the entire time like I did here. If you like your steaks a little more well done, medium or higher, then if you have a pan that has a metal handle, you can pop it right into an oven and finish them in there. About 350 degrees, depending on what temperature you want, would determine uh, how long you want to leave them in there. If you want a medium, maybe another five minutes or so. Um, Top, and the, middle, or bottom rack? Uh, middle, middle rack. And then uh, if you don't have a pan that has a metal handle, you can put them in a baking dish or um, on a sheet pan, whatever you have at home, and finish them in the oven to get them to the temperature that you want. Just you don't want to use a, a handle that's plastic or something. Exactly, okay. yeah. Don't want to put the plastic in the oven. All, All right. right, let's, let's so, do this. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to grab our plate. Okay. And I'm going to grab some of our mushrooms. It's all about the presentation too, yeah. isn't it, Chef? So we're gonna do a nice pile of mushrooms right in the center of the plate. What type of wine would you serve with this? So in this case, I would serve a really big uh, red wine, a Cabernet or a Pinot Noir. Um, I think that's gonna be what pairs really well with, uh, with this dish. Okay. Um, the earthiness and, and the big bold flavors of those reds are gonna go really nice with the earthiness of the mushrooms and the truffle. And, mm -hmm. and any, what about a starch? Uh, you could do potatoes. Again, you could do just about anything. You really almost don't need a starch with it because the mushrooms are going to give you a lot of that earthy component and it's going to provide a lot of richness for the dish. Anyway. So this is self-sustaining. That's yep. it. Just one yep. dish. Okay. We're going to go ahead and put our filet. Oh, I'm so lucky. <laughs> and then I'm going to take a nice little bit of our truffle sauce. Oh. How about a nice lot of bit of it? Okay. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> oh, my word. All right. And we should be ready to you know, give it a try. You know, sometimes you just got to eat on camera, even though it isn't pretty. <laughs> this looks amazing. So I'm going to take off my facial covering, only to eat. And all right. Is there a proper way to chop through this thing? Nope. Just, you just go at it. I'm just going to go at it. Have at it. Ooh, cuts like butter. Oh my gosh, I think, all right, so I'm gonna get a little bit of everything on there. Is that the way you're supposed to do it? Yep. A little bit of Make everything. Make sure you get plenty of that sauce on there. Oh, are you kidding me? The sauce is the star. Look at that. Wait, I don't wanna miss my mushroom. <laughs> I think I cut off too big of a piece. Is this the way you do it? Yep. Oh my, okay, this isn't gonna be pretty. Oh, hold on, don't look. <laughs> You, <laughs> you, you. I'm not supposed to talk with my mouthful. Slam dunk. Thank you very much. So incredibly delicious. Chef, this is amazing. What a treat for us today. Okay, question. Can we reheat that? Can we save the leftovers if we don't get to it all? Uh, you can, absolutely. The butter sauce won't hold up so well overnight or once you put it in the refrigerator because it will seize back up into butter. So when you do heat it back up, it is going to kind of break down just a little bit, but you're still going to get those nice flavors from it. So if you wanted to do that, it still will be great. It just may not look quite as pretty. Oh my goodness, <laughs> but it'll taste fantastic. And I got to tell you guys, I wish you were here with us. The soup is phenomenal. The steak is delicioso. It is such a privilege to be here with you, chef. So please join me in extending a huge thank you to Chef Kevin for taking us behind the magic and sharing his secrets for two of Disney's most 
popular dishes, magnifique. This was such a treat for me and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for joining us today. Have a great day, bye.